Good morning. Thank you all for arriving and arriving on time. I think we have correct and proper names in front of everyone. Since this is a consumer experience panel, want to make sure that we have a good consumer experience. And part of that is starting roughly on time. Uh, my name is Don Levy. Uh, I am not Ira Rubenstein, contrary to your program. Uh, Ira is uh, I, being a good dad and uh, helping his son. I'm sorry? Can't hear me. All right. Any better? Better? This good? This is why I talk first, because what I say matters a lot less than what our panelists say, because it's really their voices that you or who you have come here uh, to listen to. Uh, the consumer, the consumer entertainment experience certainly has changed. We've really gone from this sort of passive uh, consumption of chosen entertainment to a really exciting and dynamic marketplace. No matter what conference you go to today, you're seeing this dramatic uh, transition as we've gone from being an audience that uh, engages with content in theaters uh, and on television uh, to really entertainment everywhere. Uh, and we've also changed the dynamic of who really is a content creator. Uh, increasing mobility, uh, greater broadband, uh, everything has transformed and continues to move forward. So to uh, get things uh, started here, how many people are in fact in the content creation side of the business? and others who are in the distribution side. And technology services, basically enabling technologies. And who is actually in the wrong place? <laughs> okay. <laughs> All right. I, what I want to make sure, we're going to leave time for questions and answers at the end. I, if there are questions, I, you know, please, I, Please think of them because I want this to be a dialogue. So to get us started, let's go down the panel. I'll let each of the panelists introduce themselves uh, and uh, let you know who they are, uh, what they do, and uh, a top line about uh, their organization. We'll start, start with Verizon. Good morning. Can you guys hear me okay in the back? Uh, my name is Eric Reed. Um, I'm the Vice President of Entertainment and Tech Policy for Verizon. And so what does that entail? It's a little bit different from everybody else on this panel. Um, I look at consumer trends, where they're going in the marketplace, how business models are evolving, and then how does that relate to the investments we're making in terms of broadband connectivity. Um, the unique part of my job is I have to tie all these trends and these data points back into talking points uh, for policymakers. So uh, some of the issues around broadband access, connectivity, um, that ugly two-word uh, two term called net neutrality, um, things like that. I, um, I speak to policymakers um, throughout the Western region from Colorado all the way to Hawaii. So looking forward to actually talking about how these trends impacts the uh, greater ecosystem in terms of the other content creators that are up on this panel and uh, look forward to hearing from your questions later today as well. Thank you. Good morning, guys. Thank you for joining us. My name is Kayvon Paimani. I'm the Managing Director of the Digital Strategy Division at ICM. And what that entails, uh, I look after our efforts in the digital and digital media space, the ventures practice that we have, as well as elements of corporate strategy and business development. And so my job is really looking after our involvement with things that are generally long-term assets, or on the kind of cutting edge of what we do as an agency and what our clients do. Um, ICM, for those of you who don't know, is one of the three big full service talent agencies. We're one of the big four agencies, which I'm sure you'll be hearing about in other panels. We represent you know, superstars across every facet of the entertainment industry, uh, as well as uh, the book publishing universes and other elements of the media landscape. Um, so I'm looking forward to having a cool discussion with our colleagues up here. Thanks. Hi, I'm Richard Goldsmith, uh, 
I oversee the global media distribution, consumer products, and co-production businesses for the Jim Henson Company. Uh, we are nearly a 60-year-old business, uh, mainly known for making children's shows, but very active in prime time and feature films as well. Um, and thank you for coming today. Uh, good morning. My name is Richard Berger. I'm the Senior Vice President of Digital Strategy and Advanced Platforms for Sony Pictures Home Entertainment. Um, in the home entertainment division, our digital group focuses on the transactional business models, which are uh, VOD or rental and EST, uh, which is digital ownership product. And, and my focus is on licensing to our partners in the US. You would know of iTunes, Comcast, Amazon, so forth, and determining what digital rights the consumers get when they, when they actually acquire our, our content on those services and, 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 um, and then also focusing on what other consumer, uh, what, what other ways we can bring value to the consumer um, through those licensing agreements and, and additional content we, content that we can provide. Hi, my name is Mike Richards. Uh, I'm the executive producer of The Price is Right and Let's Make a Deal. Everybody's seen The Price is Right and Let's Make a Deal. Great. <laughs> Thank you. Um, and, and my job is to uh, make sure that the audience that's watching our show is younger than the age of the actual franchise is the way we look at it. Uh, Let's Make a Deal is 51 years old. Price is Right is uh, in its 43rd season. We just uh, did our 8,000th episode. I was not there for all of them. Um, and uh, so our, my job and my team's job is to make sure that we're still winning with our core audience, which is getting older, and, and then bringing in uh, new, younger viewers to the tent. Hi. Um, if you're following around, uh, following in the program, I need to point out that uh, I'm not John Ruby. Um, John Ruby's a bo my boss. He's CEO of Fathom Events. My name's Eric Carr. Uh, I come from, my background is from film distribution and marketing. I worked at Focus Features and New Line Cinema. And my role at those companies was working on marketing efforts with movie theaters. Uh, so recently I joined Fathom, which uh, is it's an exciting time at the company where they're expanding the network. And then they're also looking, they're getting a lot more content um, from lots of different areas. I mean, how many of you are familiar with Fathom? And probably the first thing that comes to mind is the opera. Uh, but they have a wide array of programming. This year they had a lot of success with classic films like Gone with the Wind. Uh, they just did a One Direction concert. Uh, and, they just, and they also did a, a special 50th anniversary of Doctor Who, which did huge grosses. Um, so I'm, I'm part of the team now to see what are the best ways that uh, we can reach out to content partners to bring more content into theaters and and make sure that audiences are showing up to see to see these uh, these these programs. So I'm going to let my curiosity just take me take me one place before we get into some of the some of the more traditional things. So what what are the questions I had reserved for Mike is on prices right and the demographic uh, because we are talking about an increasingly connected world. Uh, and it is, I imagine that the typical audience for the price is right is, as you suggest, not necessarily, you know, uh, <laughs> about the same age as the show, if not older. So what are you finding with your audience, not only in your effort to make it relevant to younger audiences, but are you actually noticing anything at the upper end of the spectrum with some of the people, some, some of your older audience uh, engaging with the programming any differently today? Have you seen a shift? Yes, certainly. We've done a lot of work uh, the way a lot of shows have, which is, uh, you know, with Facebook and Twitter, it gives, you know, unparalleled access to your fans. Um, it has not been a, a line drawn down age lines, to be honest. If you are interested in the show and you're a fan, or that's Price is Right, or Walking Dead or whatever it is, people want to get involved and be a part of it if they like the show. And, and one of the things that we've noticed um, is that w the more content we put out that we think as fans and producers of the show is cool, not what we think that we think, but what we would actually watch, that's what people engage in. We did a behind the scenes thing, which was completely insane to try to take on, which was a second sc screen experience where you could where we had uh, put 18 cameras all over the set, including out in the line with the contestants and everywhere. And then we synced it to when the show actually aired. And so you were able to watch us make the show while you were watching the show on. 
And it was kind of just for us. I mean, to be honest, we thought it would be really cool to see all of the moving parts and multiple screens going. And you see the guy out uh, interviewing the, the crowd. And then you see the cameras resetting for the next thing. And then you see the wheel being shoved around harder than you think it would be being shoved around and that it's probably going to end up in the Smithsonian. Um, so it was all of that. And so that's one thing. And, and it hasn't been along age lines. Like I said, it's been more if you make something cool and people like your show, that draws in engagement. Yeah, I was just going to add, you know, to Mike's point. I mean, look, I think everybody looks at the millennials as being that target rich audience in terms of trying to get for video. But it's also um, I've looked at some of the Nielsen um, uh, data reports and it's not just 18 to 24 year olds that are engaging with less uh, traditional television. It's also 35 to 49 year olds and then 50 to 62 year olds as well. So I think there's an opportunity here that even though they're shifting away from traditional television, they're actually moving to other platforms, like some of the ones mm -hmm. that you were talking about, the social platforms, and then also in terms of devices as well, you know, whether it's a smartphone or tablet. So there's a unique opportunity, I think, in terms of uh, the content industry actually growing um, this universe of consumers that are moving away from the traditional television model, but going into a more digital media, online, new media um, um, engagement. I just have to say that my 13-year-old daughter is a huge Price is Right fan. Yes! <laughs> <laughs> that just made my morning. <laughs> that's, that's great. You know, this actually leads into what, what I consider really almost the overarching uh, question. I think everybody can, can jump in and address their experience in the context of this question. But the biggest shift that seems to be out there is this shift to mobility. Uh, and the numbers of people who are accessing content either through uh, mobile internet or apps. Uh, it, certainly the, the phone, which is probably the least used app on a phone, is the phone, uh, has you know, really transformed. But we really have a mobile consumer. So how significant is that transition? What are some of the stats on that? And then within the context of that, what really are the, the most significant sort of trends that we're noticing, uh, both in uh, uh, with consumer behavior? So, I, you know, it's occurring in the home and outside the home. I think in the home, uh, the latest stats I've seen are there's seven connected devices in the home, obviously. Interactive television um, is driving that, tablets, smartphones, as you talked about. Uh, but for Verizon personally, in terms of our uh, Fios mobile app, uh, as of this year, we have 135 million hours being accessed through our mobile app. So you're starting to see that, again, that traditional TV shift of watching television in the home uh, to wanting to take that content anytime, anywhere on any device. Uh, so again, it, 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 when you start talking about Fios in the home and fiber optics technology, it's robust, it's great, it's fantastic. Um, we're talking about providing the consumer up to 500 megs um, down, in terms of download speeds. Uh, we just had a speed match uh, offer where we're now doing 500 megs um, uh, back upload speed, so we're making these speeds symmetrical. Um, and so that's important because obviously a lot more people are consuming content. And then if you flip it to going outside the home, again, making sure that you have that rich app experience, making sure that you have great wireless networks that can take on the capacity for, you know, any sort of interactive content that Sony or Jim Henson or, you know, The Price is Right might be producing. Um, it's critically important because nobody wants a, uh, to be watching any of their content that they want to access uh, being affected by jitter or latency and all those things. So. We're, uh, we're looking to acquire more spectrum to meet the demand of uh, a lot of these content producers on this, uh, on this panel. And uh, it's, this is really, I think, an exciting time uh, for the consumer. You know, I'll say um, from our perspective, both on the talent side as well as on the content creator side, the ability to reach the fan or the audience on their terms as opposed to the terms that you know, the industry has kind of dictated over the better part of the last 50 years has been the most monumental shift in the way that we think about the business. You know, on, on the talent side, the idea of a mobile community, a mobile first engagement, the, the fact that we know where the fans of our clients are 
and what they like and the types of things that they engage in in a day is, is pretty amazing information to be able to then react against. Um, on the content side, you know, we've definitely seen this, a trend where interactive, which has been kind of the buzzword, I feel like, for 10 years or more, um, has really started to get into its own, where millions of people around the world interface through their mobile apps to actually shape the content that's being shown to them. Uh, you know, Rising Star this summer is a great example. And that's just the tip of the iceberg of a crowd of people shaping the actual television experience as it's happening or seeing the behind the scenes, as Mike was alluding to earlier. Like, that these are the kinds of things that just deepen the engagement of the audience to the content that they love, which we think is a, a pretty remarkable and great thing, not only for our clients, but the industry itself. Uh, for us, the uh, the advent of you know TV everywhere uh, has been absolutely huge. Uh, you know the kids um, part of this has been among the most prolific. So when you talk to Netflix or Hulu or Amazon, uh, the kids business is very very urgent to them. Uh, you know Reed Hastings will go on CNBC and spend a third of his interview talking about the kids business. So. Um, you know, kids are earlier adopters. Uh, you know, anyone who's 10 or 12 that has their own mobile phone or is on it all day. Um, we're seeing uh, two year olds on mom's uh, devices throughout the day. Um, it's created a whole new opportunity for us to create content for two to four year olds that TV networks don't want to air. Um, but, you know, for us, it's, uh, it's created new opportunity to produce original content for these platforms, to distribute our library content, to distribute our current content. It's made our TV networks, uh, you know, particularly Turner and Disney and Nickelodeon more powerful because you can view all their content on demand whenever you want. So it's, it's had a, a tremendous impact on our business um, from a financial standpoint, both to create new content and to distribute um, you know, more of our library content. Um, <clears throat> it's probably worth uh, just taking a step back for a second because it's not even more than five, six years ago when we first started distributing our, our movies and TV shows digitally in a, you know, a digital ownership model, yet what we call electronic sell-through, where the experience was was pretty limited. I, I think that's pretty natural when when content providers try something new. They're, 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 of course, there's they're always the concern of, of piracy, but, but back then, you pretty much, consumer would buy a movie and they were allowed a download um, to a PC and then maybe they could make a copy to a portable device uh, sideloaded from, from that PC. But if, you, if your device crashed or something happened, you lost your content. Um, and I think that uh, certainly we and I think the other major studios have really embraced digital distribution over the last several years and have been working really hard to enhance that consumer experience, um, enabling the consumer to, to watch it on any device, so granting the rights so that you can, you, you know, you can not only watch it on your PC, but any other device that comes out. Um, there's been a big movement to actually getting back to the TV set, right? So uh, a lot of people want to watch that digitally distributed movie in their living room, and, and for a while, you really couldn't do that very easily. And I think the advent of a lot of the, the set-top boxes, the over-the-top boxes, the game consoles, smart TVs, um, you know, that just gets rolled into the license that we do, and, and I think that's still now a primary way that people are viewing their movies. But we don't want to have to limit consumers in any way. This is actually, I would say, the first time where we're much more for the consumer than some of the, even the, the service providers and technology companies. We want the consumer to have complete flexibility and choice when they buy our movies and, and TV shows. So whatever device they want, um, whenever they want, um, and we even don't want them to be locked into one service provider, which is why we've we've been really behind the ultraviolet, um, you know, movement and 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 helped create that. Um, that if you're not familiar with that, basically what what you do is that the cloud rights that you get um, are not just linked specifically to one service provider where you bought the content. The the consumer has their own ultraviolet um, library in the cloud, and then they get to choose which services, which ultraviolet services they link to it. So then they have a choice of where to buy and then where to access. And that is, I think, the most freedom we've ever um, provided to consumers. And what we're trying to do is to get all service providers to, to adopt that because ultimately the real value for the consumer with, with that model is when there's, you know, it's ubiquitous and there's, you know, choice from, from everywhere. I think the other point that the other, the other guys brought up, which is really important, and we're spending a lot of time focusing on it, is now that the consumer can watch it on any device, 
um, how do we enhance that experience? Um, for years and years, we've we've made extra content behind the scenes. Um, you know, the interviews with cast and crew available on our DVDs and Blu-rays. But you know, outside of maybe one or two service providers digitally, you pretty much buy the movie and you get just the movie. And so we've been really working on trying to uh, enable a standard way where studios can can actually produce that content once like we did for DVD and Blu-ray and have it easily incorporated into any digital service that they want. And so we, we actually are working on that with all the other major studios and with Movie Labs and there's a spec available and we're, we're actively trying to get um, you know, the service providers to adopt that. That's really cool because my son was just asking me why there were no extras for Iron Man 3 because we got it from iTunes and all he could do was watch the movie and he wanted to see how they made the Iron Man suit, which he still thinks is real. So that's awesome. Um, we're going, uh, it's kind of a two-prong attack for Price is Right and Let's Make a Deal. Uh, it's, it's available online, cbs.com. People download it if they miss the episode. We are seeing DVR uh, uh, plus three and plus seven numbers that are telling us that people are doing that. It's interesting. I think daytime television, it, you don't hear it talked about this way, but it is a little bit of appointment viewing because even the millennials, the college students, I was just talking to a, a guy who you would, it was like a 19 year old kid who you would not expect to be a Price is Right fan. And uh, he goes, oh yeah, no, we hustle back from class to make sure we watch it. And I was like, do you not have a DVR or a computer? And he's like, well, yeah but we kind of all get together and play the game together. And so in daytime, I think it's as much about the appointment viewing and then giving broad other things for them to access when they're not in front of the TV than it is, oh, I, you know, people will watch The Price is Right, I'm sure, on an, on an iPad. I think it's a more of a community experience and it's on while you're at home and, and doing your day-to-day -day activities. Um, and I really think it's for us been the other things that we add on. We just announced in the USA Today this morning that we're doing a male model search, um, which I'm a judge on. Uh, <laughs> it's a dream come true. Uh, I, just, I just kept saying, I went to college, and now that guy doesn't have a shirt on. Awesome. Um, <laughs> But it's a, it's a web series that you'll be able to access, and we assume you'll watch everywhere but in front of your television. And then we hope that drives you to the actual TV show. And that's, that's the way we're attacking it. So, I, and, and I think just for people who aren't familiar with Fathom, just to give an idea, I mean, Fathom is we're creating all the live events or any kind of alternative content. We're not creating it. We're actually distributing it to theaters. Um, and it's about 800 theaters nationally. It's primarily AMC, Cinemark, and Regal. Uh, so it's just, it's a growing network. The technology is changing. So in the next um, couple of years, it, actually in the next year or two, content's going to be delivered to theaters via satellite. Um, right now it's by hard drives through digital distribution and it's going to be delivered by the, the um, satellite. So I think with this, with this change, there's a big opportunity to do more live events. And what we found is that is the big draw for a lot of, for a lot of consumers to come to theaters is this you know, live, only one night only kind of experience that you can only get there. Um, and as far as mobile, uh, one, you know, one of the biggest uh, successes that we've had is with this, The Fault in Our Stars. And there was a huge uh, fan base around that film. And the Thursday night going into opening weekend, we, we partnered with Fox and we did an event where we invited you know, fans, it was a $25 ticket, they got, they got commemorative items which would add to the experience. It was a bracelet and a special poster. But they could also tweet in questions to the people who were going to be part of the Q&A. So basically it's this national live Q&A of people sitting in an auditorium of a movie that they really were passionate about and wanted to see. Um, and they were engaged through, the, through mobile. So we're looking to see how we can expand on that with other events, with films that people are really passionate about or you know, there's there, all areas of, of entertainment and content coming to theaters. You know, I wanted to add one thing because that, that's a really key point, the idea of turning the viewing experience into an event experience for the audience. So we've been, over the last couple of years, pretty involved in thinking about television as one of the kind of entry points into that experience. And some of it's obvious, right, where the Super Bowl is an event because it's happening live and you want to watch it. But game shows also fall pretty strongly into that bucket, too, where in Europe and Asia, We've been turning the game show experience into an at-home play-along experience for a couple of years with our partners, screens, and others. And, and I think that that idea of turning something into event viewing 
which we've been doing in other facets of the entertainment industry for many years, is becoming an even more real experience when you layer the mobile experience on top of that, because it gives the audience a reason to actually engage with the show when the show's on, which is obviously what we want as an entertainment industry to actually keep keep occurring. So the, the idea of borrowing kind of the, the tools and trades from the live events universe and pulling that into even non-linear shows, right? Even even shows that are that are not happening in real time right now, I think is going to be the thing that we all should be keeping an eye on over the next several years because that's going to start to become the way I think that a lot of television is viewed. Well, if I could jump on that, we I just saw possibly the coolest thing I've seen associated with prices, right? Where you were actually able to, and I have no idea how the technology worked, but it, it again synced up with the show and you were able to play along on your screen and say, how much do you think that car is? How much for the bar of soap? And literally play along and go, no, that person's wrong. And then it, it was seamless. And so you literally played the game while the person was playing the game and you might win or they might win or, and it was, I, Listen, I've seen like 2,000 tapings now, and it was the most excited I've been. And I'm, by the way, I was terrible at it, but it was amazing to be able to interact. And I thought, wow, if our audience ever really got a hold of that and, and, and the technology worked you know, consistently, which I think is important, yeah. it's insane what it would do for us. Well, that's why I think it's so important that we have to, you know, it's coming upon the ISPs, particularly Verizon, that we build all this exciting capacity because then it allows you all to experiment and to build new models again for interactivity um you know back to eric's point about you know building these uh broadband connections into the theaters you know think about the old way that we used to watch movies you'd get the physical film you would run it for a month even if it was a dud um in the uh, box office but you still had to keep that physical film it got sent to you send it back now with if you have a great broadband connection if it's a dud, you could swap it out in a couple of days and put something else in that slot. So I think there's uh, new efficiencies being created um, in terms of looking at this new digital distribution space. It just uh, talking about the interactive side, um, we've been very disappointed about uh, the platforms that we're on, about how slow they are to move on interactivity. Um, you know, for example, YouTube. Um, we're one of the largest global suppliers to YouTube, and you know, obviously they have I don't know seven or eight percent of the TV audience now, but very little interactivity. You know, they're good at curation, they're good at fan engagement, but you know, I've been shocked about how slow they are to, uh, you know, uh, bring in even very basic interactive elements. And I think that that is something that needs to change to really differentiate these platforms from you know traditional linear platforms. All of this it, it kind of leads to my, my next next question, which is we've touched on it a bit, uh, which is how the audience is engaging with content across uh, platforms. They're not just isolated and watching in one place and one venue and one medium. Uh, so if I think you've all given some good examples already. If there are others, please feel free to volunteer. But also let's think of it in terms of the gaps, because you just kind of indicated one of the gaps uh, with the lack of interactivity on one of the more popular access points for video. Are there other gaps, whether it be in uh, services, technology, and so forth, uh, that are you 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 see the customer moving there, but ah, there's a barrier. Well, I will say with theaters, they've been they've had a lot of barriers about film coming into their locations and not being distributed on other platforms. And it's interesting when you look at Doctor Who, which is a film uh, content that's typically watched on TV, and then it grosses six million dollars in one day. Like, you know, I think they're starting to see there has been some discussion and press with, from exhibition leaders like, why isn't Game of Thrones available? You know, on uh, for, to see in theaters. I mean, it's a it's a film, a uh, TV show that everybody is very passionate about. I believe I read it was the most pirated show on television from whatever measures they were using. Uh, it just seems there's an opportunity now with theaters where they're looking at how can we get some content. And there could be, there's union rules or guild rules about coming into theaters that are, that are, that's a barrier for theaters at the moment. But I do think that that's where things are heading, where, you know, it's going to be about that shared experience of coming together at a theater to, to watch content that you're really passionate about. 
I think, you know, the most frustrating thing for me is just delivering good video quality. Um, I'm still shocked about how bad it is. Uh, you know, I have the fastest Time Warner service in my home. It's, I think it's 100 megabytes per second. I've spent thousands of dollars putting routers in my house so it actually can work, which is a joke that I have to do that. Um, I have a backup Verizon system in case Time Warner goes down so my kids don't freak out. Um, <laughs> and it's just, you know, I, I think in general, you know, the, the people that are delivering the video to you um, <clears throat> have a long way to go to make that work. Um, when you're in a hotel, you know, the, the routers within these, these hotels need to dramatically improve because it's pretty horrible, especially if you travel like I do all around the world. You'd be shocked about how bad it is. Um, so I, I think that that's a great area of frustration. Plus, by the platform, how your streaming is, you know, varies. So if you're a Netflix user, you realize that their quality is pretty good. And then when you look at my content on PlayStation or Xbox or other platforms, it's horrible. So I think that that really needs to improve to have, you know, growth in the industry and have a really seamless experience. Richard, I think I can help you with that. So number one, let's get you signed up for Fias and make you <laughs> our primary customer. Yeah. I mean, unfortunately, just, it's not in my neighborhood. That's uh, the biggest uh, problem. Yeah, it's in so, mine. Yeah. And that's, okay. that, that's a municipality issue, and I'm not going to bore everybody about that. But, you know, the larger issue, particularly, I think, uh, what Richard's frustration is talking about, particularly when he travels, and I do a lot of traveling as well, is that it's very inconsistent for municipality to municipality where you go to to get good wireless service. And guess what? When we're going to start rolling, well, you're already starting to roll out 4K. Um, there's always, uh, there's been some experimentation to get to 8K. Uh, that 4K picture is going to suck if uh, you don't have enough throughput and uh, customers are going to be pissed off because the expectation now is if I'm paying all this money uh, for my kids or my family to enjoy entertainment, it better be a seamless experience. And if it's not, the finger is going to be pointed at us. So, you know, I hope that each and every one of you, um, if I can make you into policy champions, whenever your next, we go to your next uh, board meeting um, at your city council that you tell them, these wireless ordinances for us not to put small cell equipment um, in various neighborhoods and communities to densify the network, uh, to make these network connections faster, that you tell them, hey, look, we need these connections. We are a 24-7 connected society, and we don't want Richard to be frustrated. And I don't want to be frustrated with the hundreds of dollars that I'm paying for broadband service, but it can't work because you're saying that it's going to take us 9 to 12 months to build out um, or get... Um, applications approved. So uh, just think about that the next time you go to your city council meetings. And if you need talking points, I'll talk to you after this. <laughs> and hashtag fast Richard. Yeah, that's right. I would say the one gap that I'm seeing with our audience, uh, whether it's the, the young audience or the, the older audience, is that all of this stuff is still too hard yeah. for them to do, yeah. to, to really harness and trying to walk them through just that second screen experience or whatever it is, like we will put up the male model episodes on PricesRight.com and you will push play. That's it. And so some of the other things where it gets more complex, even, you know, you go and you're on, in, in your menu on your TV and your, your Apple TV or whatever it is and you've got Netflix and, and then, oh wait, uh, Showtime, that I don't have that set up right. It's, I think, the ease with which it jumps from platform to platform um, along with the broadband, which to me is improving. But that's where I'm seeing our audience pump the brakes and go, it's just still too complex. It's not, you know, quite idiot proof. If you know, there's, which there's, there's, there's one other angle to that kind of issue as well. I mean, we tend to think of it from the standpoint of the opportunity that exists for real imagination and, and execution to come together. And uh, in a lot of cases, what's missing is imagining what you would actually do in that circumstance and, and giving the audience an actual reason to want to go that one extra step to download the app or open the website or or experience whatever ancillary thing you're hoping they're going to experience in the moment that the show's on. And a lot of the thoughts that we run across are working with our producers, working with our network colleagues, working with our studio colleagues to try and figure out and, and really brainstorm from the ground up what is the creative around that? Like what is the actual audience experience going to look like and feel like and be and and ultimately why does that matter 
Yeah, I was just going to add, I think, uh, to your point, Kevin, and uh, what Richard Berger said earlier, how do we make the consumer experience easier? I mean, we've made it very difficult in terms of authentication. Uh, we've talked about this on a number of panels at Digital Hollywood, talking about the different passwords you got to kind of memorize for HBO Go and Show and Showtime and you know all the other different awesome content that you kind of get through your mobile apps. I think if we can break that barrier, and I'm starting to see that a little bit. Um, you know, you're talking about the ultraviolet experience. Um, if we can empower consumers uh, to just have one password to authenticate themselves, um, I think we'll see a lot less grief from consumers and we can actually concentrate on creating uh, great value for the consumer. There's been a lot of uh, criticism on this panel for the consumer experience, not enough bandwidth, not enough, uh, you know, the video quality is not high enough because of that. It's, it's too hard to set up. Um, I think there are always going to be cases like that, but I, I'm going to just counter that a little bit and, and again talk about where we've come from and how much easier it is now than it was. Yeah. Um, and I it think is. that there's a lot to, to be optimistic about. Um, I think, uh, you know, we, we do an attitudes and usage study every year um, for home entertainment consumers. And, you know, for the most part, um, it's like almost 90% customer satisfaction with digital services. Um, and in particular, that's stats for uh, ultraviolet services. And that's on par with iTunes and Netflix and things like that. Um, and so for a lot of people who have a home network, you know, who have some level of bandwidth, it's actually, uh, it's actually a pretty good experience um, where you don't actually have to leave your couch. You can just click buy or rent and it starts streaming instantly. It's it, not too long ago, you had to wait hours for a download to happen. Now we can stream instantly. You can download, play it offline. There's a lot of things that you can do today that you couldn't do um, before. We are we are looking forward though. We're you know we're always trying to make things better. 4K is coming. We're a big proponent of 4K, and those files are bigger. But the technology is getting better. The the bandwidth is getting better in capacity. But there's also better compression uh, out there. Adaptive streaming has made a huge difference where you don't have that buffering anymore. It does impact your video quality, um, you know, depending on the characteristics of your bandwidth at the time of playback. But I think there's a lot to be optimistic about too. And, um, and I, I do think like, you know, just the, the idea of not having to go out to a video store and buy, you know, buy or rent something and come back home and then go return it, you know, it, it's actually a lot more convenient to just click a button and start watching. And I know that's certainly what my family does. It's, it's very simple. You know, building on that kind of optimistic case is we've seen a lot of interesting movement in the audience themselves and the audience's propensity to want to do other things. I mean, if you look at some of the work that our partner Screens has done in territories like in Israel or Portugal or others, you know, the, the apps that are out there, where whether it's a cookbook VOD experience for MasterChef in Israel, which becomes the number one cookbook, not just a second screen experience, but actually the cookbook that people use, or the experiences that they've built here where you know, audiences are actually voting in real time to have something happen on a show which wasn't possible before, if not for the new technology. I mean, arguably, these are experiences that two, three years ago, the audience wouldn't have expected to be able to do. And the fact that that audience is starting to migrate by the millions, not by the tens, is a really interesting sign around the world. And and it is a global phenomenon. Right? I mean, you go territory by territory, Japan, Israel, even places that one would typically associate with piracy, we're starting to see these actual engagement numbers increase. And just to prove that, I mean, we're seeing 60%, 50% of audiences actually play along with games in, in other territories. And that's not an anomaly because we see pretty amazing engagement here in the US as well across those platforms. Now, all of that with a caveat that says we're at the beginning of the beginning, I'm, I'm pretty excited about where that's going to go though, because it, it proves to us that one, our creators will continue to matter because those are the people that are going to be creating these experiences. The producers that create the game shows that are on air, audiences care about these things and have cared about them for 50 years. So it's, it's our jobs really to help our clients and to help our partners on the tech side help build those experiences and then rely on our friends in the infrastructure world and our friends on the studio and network side to experiment in that space. Well, well you know, I was going to say, you know, the consumers are winning. Um, you know, there, there's a lot that consumers are getting now. You know, you look back five years ago um, and from an optimistic lens, 
Um, you know, if you go to the Fios mobile app, you have 160 channels that you can get inside the home and 60 <coughs> outside the home. Probably five years ago, you probably had less than 40. Um, and if you're talking about video on demand titles, there are 70,000 that you can access now. And again, you could probably only get half of that, if not less, uh, five years ago. So yeah, you're right. There's, we shouldn't be uh, promoting the gloom and doom. I think it's just an opportunity for us to, <laughs> we all want more, you know? to yeah. continue to strive forward. But you know, the outlook is really good. I mean, for the entire ecosystem, not only for the content creators and the producers and the infrastructure uh, broadband providers, but also, you know, the consumers are actually winning in the end. Thank you. Consumer. Gigabit would be nice, though. The what? Gigabit fiber would be nice. Oh, yeah. Well, it's we're testing on that, too. <laughs> and I hope this gentleman right here that had his phone ring, I hope that's a, a Verizon phone. Well. <laughs> there you go. Uh, if not, I'm going to have to ask you to leave. <laughs> Oh, fantastic. Okay. <laughs> you can I, stay. I would like to open uh, the floor up to questions. We have uh, just about 30 minutes left, and I want to make sure that with a distinguished panel here and a terrific audience there, that uh, we kind of bridge that gap here. So, questions, please. So, a question for Eric. So, um, you're talking about doing interactive engagement in movie theaters, but. Um, why well, they do I mean there's a policy where they're trying to create a consumer experience overall but this is alternative content it's a different kind of experience I mean when we're creating an event that it makes sense for the patrons to tweet in a question theaters are okay with it you know I think that we're we're aware of who that audience is that we're targeting and if it's appropriate. And I think on the theatrical side, they are experimenting with maybe show times that would be mobile you know, use okay for a regular theatrical run of a, of a film. Uh, but yeah, I, I see what you're saying. I think that the theater owners are looking at if this is, if it makes sense, if it's going to make it a better experience for our patrons, then, then they'll do it. But in general, when people go to the movies, they don't want people <coughs> on their cell phone. <laughs> Um, well, the, the, we've been really lucky on prices, right? And let's make a deal that our ratings continue to go up. Um, in the last three years, we um, continue to go up. We just saw double digit gains in the demo that you're talking about on on let's make a deal. Um, so we're and we're we're doing that by multiple forms of engagement, which is to say, for instance, on on let's make a deal, we we just did uh, an entire episode that is. Um, created by Twitter. So we give them decisions and then as producers we take the day off and they decide what's going to happen. And sometimes it's it's great and sometimes we're scrambling <laughs> around trying to make sure it's great. Um, but that's a great way that we've uh, engaged people on the show. To be honest, um, on our shows, they're very different. Uh, Price is right. We have, we have Drew Carey who appeals to that younger audience even though he is not in that demo. Um, and uh, humor seems to be a big deal for the for the younger audience. I think it always has been. That's why Let's Make a Deal does kind of ridiculous numbers in the in the uh, eighteen to twenty four right in that space. I mean, it's really amazing, and it's because Wayne Brady, that audience that loves him on Whose Line Is It Anyway, is is now watching him on daytime. And and I'll go pound for pound. I love Whose Line, and I think we're as funny as it as it is but we also give away really cool prizes and and you get people in corn cob outfits so you it touches a lot of different people in a lot of different ways but and then another way we've really targeted it on prices we've gone with more relevant prizes i mean it's you've got to be able to you know there used to be grandfather clocks on <laughs> and i was like yeah that's it's named grandfather you know let's not <laughs> let's not put that on um although we did do it on april fools where we gave away four grandfather clocks one after the other and then we gave them the money but um <laughs> but so we're doing things like that and we have a lot of fun with the franchises it's not taken seriously but in the end it's content and and the young our younger audience is coming because 
our content is fun and sometimes uh, irreverent and sometimes very reverential. So that's that's the way we're doing it. And then all that other stuff is, which as a producer is so fun. You guys were mentioning because we just get to go hog wild and and do things without all of the. Um, importance of having to put a huge network show on, which those two are, are big shows, then we just get to go do webisodes and, and be funny and do the things that we all wanted to do when we got into it in the first place. And then you first. Well, I think it's not an either or proposition. I think it's all the above. Um, we got to have our hands in all sorts of different spaces. Um, I got six billion reasons. At least that's what uh, Price Waterhouse Coopers tells me in terms of um, 2014 spend by consumers in the over the top market. Um, so that's a huge opportunity for us to play there. Um, I, you know, our chairman and CEO has also talked about um, a potential offering in 2015, uh, which will leverage our wireless network to complement our uh, our FIOS uh, television operant, uh, offering. Um, so I think we have to wear multiple hats. Um, it's not just an either or proposition, and we'll just be playing in a lot of different spaces and investing billions of dollars in terms of making sure that we ramp up capacity, ramp up the capabilities of our networks, and making sure that consumers uh, can actually have uh, a variety of choices in terms of whether it's through a broadband connection or through the traditional uh, linear television model. I'll do that. I'll do that real, I mean, we are, again, we are our biggest successes, and I would say it's probably uh, the panel has had similar experiences, is when we do stuff that's actually cool, that actually makes people want to be a part of it or see it. And, and it's, for us, we have really good, CBS is a great partner, um, I work for Fremantle, and they're kind of into take some risks because no one's figured it out yet. And that is the fun of being on, on the, in the wild, wild west of this. Sometimes, and, and the way, so, and to answer your question, so we try what we think would be cool, to be honest. And, and as a content uh, maker, that's really fun. Um, the metrics are all over the place as far as whether it worked because it's never been done before. So what did you, what did you expect traffic to be on the website? So we'll, we'll say, oh, you know, our site gets this much traffic on a weekly basis or daily basis. And then we did this and we see a, a change in, you know, a, a monstrous change in traffic. Okay. That had good engagement. Did they come back the next week to, to sample that product, whatever it was again, and then ultimately does it drive ratings? So all of those things, you know, there's, there's ways to measure it, but if you set out just to do that, I have found you, it's like saying, I'm going to create a viral video. Mm -hmm. Yeah, That's uh, not a thing. I want to, I want to really echo the importance of that because I mean, obviously we, we see the number of our transactions growing. We can see the revenue growing as over time, as we're making a lot of these changes. But I think that can't be the only lens that you're looking at this. You, you absolutely have to have the ability to try new things. And you know, we're fortunate enough at Sony Pictures to have that culture where we really want to innovate. We, want to, you know, we have a, a lot of passionate people that are, are trying to do things that, that we think will be cool. 
we can measure engagement. You know, you never really could do that before. I think that helps. But um, we don't have the silver, bu silver bullet answer. So we're going to just keep trying things. And we should, you know, I think the main thing is just not to be afraid to fail. You know, and just keep trying again and again until you know maybe we'll come up with some new feature that really makes people want to buy movies um, in a different way, you know, than they did before. Um, you know, so we're we're just we're really looking for all all kinds of new angles. I'll give you a pride where we we had no idea whether it would work or not, but we thought it was cool, so we did it. Um, in our in our movies in in. Um, and that extras experience when you buy a movie you get the you know the behind the scenes deleted scenes all the stuff that we used to do that people we know people like because we've we've seen um you know on surveys people answer that but um to take advantage of the the sort of the digital platform we're allowing people to find their favorite clips in the movie and share them out on facebook and twitter we call it clip and share um and because we know um you know, a people like to talk about um, movies when when they uh, you know when they see them with their friends, and and we thought let's give them an easy way to share the scene. Say hey, this is a great scene, check it out. And then when the, the their friend sees it, they click on it. It takes them to see the clip, and then they have a, a an option to buy it right right then and there. So we like that. Um, the other thing we did was we 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 actually mark up every scene of the movie every frame of every scene with enhanced metadata so we know exactly what's going on throughout the movie so you can search anything in the dialogue an object whatever and it'll jump right to the scene and you can watch your favorite moments we call that enhanced scene search and um as far as i know we're the only studio that's that's been doing that we've been doing it for a couple of years now and, and um we just think it's a really cool way for for consumers who are buying and collecting movies to be able to you know have more control over it when uh all of the uh, subscription VOD companies started Hulu, Netflix, Amazon several years ago. We were among the leading suppliers of kids content, and it was insane. Uh, the end of three years ago, the end of the year, uh, Christmas week, we did millions and millions of dollars in business because they just couldn't spend money quick enough. Um, and they acquired all these old series from our catalog. The business has changed over the last 18 months where they're becoming much more selective as to um, having, you know, maybe a Fraggle Rock, which is considered a classic series that we have, but maybe not some of the 30 or 40 other series that we have. So it's created a business opportunity for us now where we've created our own channel, um, which is an OTT. Um, so we, you know, which mainly consists of our catalog content. Um, which is focused on, you know, reaching moms who want high quality content for their kids who are under the age of six. Um, and now, you know, and we're on almost every platform and it's expanding globally. Um, but so that's created kind of new revenue opportunities for, for our content, both on a subscription basis and an ad supported basis. But in order for that to become successful moving forward, we a need more content. We need exclusive content. Uh, we need original productions, and we need it to be interactive with the audience. So that is now forcing us to uh, either invest or get an investor for a very large sum of money to have it compete with everyone else. Can I just ask you two guys a question? Because you have all these super cool things that you just mentioned. How do you get the word out on technology like that? Because that's something that we've run into, and I mean. Some of those things you just mentioned are like, I didn't know that. Right. You know, yeah. and that's really cool. I think that's that's a big challenge, um, particularly for for a studio where we distribute through multiple partners, and we pretty much rely on them to reach the the consumer. Obviously, going direct to consumer is is another way, and we do have a Sony Picture Store, but you know, it, it's it, it takes all it takes a lot, and you have to continue to to make that message available. So, some of the things that we can do, like. One of the, you know, we, we offer ultraviolet on on discs now. So like we have a little call out so that people know that when they buy the disc, they can actually get the digital rights and put it in their cloud. And to the extent that we can start messaging when they get there, all the other things that you can do, try these new extras. We have to partner with our distribution partners to get that message out to consumers. Uh, but it, it's that's that's a big challenge. It's not just enough to create the experience. We really have to figure out how to make people aware of it. Too. Yeah, you're, and I totally agree with you. The the key opportunity is partnering with distribution partners. So a very large telephone company or telco company, whatever technology company, technology company. <laughs> um, not to you know not to name who it is. Um, 
we are talking to about our Jim Henson Family TV channel because they have told us that, you know, mom is a very big uh, buyer of their services, particularly broadband. Kids content is very important to them. We need to tap into their tens of millions of uh, subscribers because we can't afford to advertise it. I mean, our, our app, you know, our OTT channel is on every platform. You don't know it's there. So the only way that we can get the word out is through social media, but really it's exactly what you just said, which is that it's partnering with your distribution partners. So even when I have a, you know, we just did the first original series for kids for Hulu, you know, we partnered with them to get the marketing out because we're just a teeny company. We can't afford to spend millions of dollars in advertising. Mm -hmm. Sir. So since I've been at this conference, um, Pretty much everybody's talking almost exclusively about video. Why isn't audio a part of any of your dialogues, especially as content creators and you know, distributors? Yeah. And content? Why, why is audio not? Well, it, it is. It just you're just happening. Yeah. Like a lot of the focus that we have is on the video side because of the bandwidth issues that affect the video business versus the audio business. But you know, when you look at our roster of musicians. The way that streaming music has impacted the music industry, frankly, you know, I had a startup back in the days of the earlier days of Napster and others, right? I mean, audio has ridden a different wave that the video business is still right in the middle of. And so in some ways, the story for audio has been written out and we're already well underway in addressing those issues, right? Where streaming has become uh, a dominant way in which to experience any type of audio experience. Yeah. And and that is the kind of conversations that we have in our hallways as well as we have with our record label partners. But the other side of it is that, you know, human beings are very visual creatures and the experience of video tends to be different than ex the experience of audio. And and it's 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 built in with more challenges, right? The the challenges of video becoming grainy and and poor are not as bad in the audio world. And so that that's part of the reason why and it just so happens that, you know, my friends and colleagues here all happen to really focus on the video side, but it's not that audio is not important. It's well, just, and also you know, you're answering it, I think, in the audio in terms of music. In correct. Music yeah, industry, and there's other but things. But audio so. as a portion of the video, um, yeah, and I think it's right. a matter of sure right. if the panel were longer, we would get there too, because mm -hmm. <laughs> <laughs> um, we do think it's really important. We we mentioned 4K as a next generation video. We're always um, working with, you know, all the leading audio um, technology companies to enable a better some of the surround sound experience and and the technology just keeps getting better and better in the theaters we're we're doing things and that's making its way into the home um, a lot of the new technologies require you know the consumers to actually have the equipment to to, to actually play it back and right. some of those things are are starting to launch from the likes of Dolby and DTS and so forth but um, we're always interested in giving the consumer the best picture and the best sound for for our movies for our you know for our highest premium um, SKUs. Yeah, that's I, a great point. I um I invest in a lot of startups and the VC that I invest with um, just looked at a deal where um, they are aggregating uh, audio that's non-music, you know, sound bites and sound effects and speeches and and it was a brilliant plan because everyone has completely ignored that space. Um, so I, I think that at least this one company, huh? It could be, <laughs> but, uh, you know, I was blown away when I read it, just that no one has really aggregated audio. Um, and it's, you know, because of the focus on video, it could be, I'd like to know. <laughs> well, let's be honest. I mean, they're both complimentary. You can't have one without the other good sound, bad picture, bad experience, good picture, bad sound, bad experience. So, um, you know, they're not mutually exclusive. You know, it's just one of these things I think you pointed out, right, Kevin? It's just, you know, we would need a lot longer talk, time period to talk about um, the engagement of investment in, um, in audio and sound. But, you know, I think we all agree that they're all they're both complementary. You need both to have a enriched uh, consumer experience. Yeah, Fathom has certainly there's live performance there which right. is but, video driven but there's probably uh, from a consumer experience standpoint probably an audio piece of that yeah i mean we're, we're relying on you know putting together producing the best live stream so that when it's received at the theater there's the best presentation which includes the audio and as the distribution of the content changes which is going to happen next year um, there'll be more flexibility to use different auditoriums. And in some theaters, they're using Dolby Atmos or 
other technology. Although I think you do have to, there's special formatting if you want to be exhibited in Dolby Atmos. But I mean, theaters are making a big investment to have the best presentation possible. And as our partners, we're relying on them to deliver our content that way. Is it also fair to say that uh, sometimes people want to listen to music, but they also want to see the uh, see the performance? Oh, definitely. I mean, so the, the two are, are complimentary yeah. uh, to each other. Yeah, yes. that's, that's definitely a big part of that. Can, please. Well, we uh, again, it's a frustration that a lot of the uh, uh, platforms that we're on now don't link to our consumer products or our publishing businesses or our digital businesses. Um, I think that will change. Um, Amazon in the kids space just uh, with a show called Fireman Sam for the first time uh, took exclusive consumer products that they're selling on Amazon and exclusive rights to the series. I think that's the future. Um, just again, people, it's very frustrating. People are, you know, I should be able to, you know, I can go now on our YouTube channel. You can click through and buy, but it's very kind of clunky and, and every platform needs to do that. So when we talk with Amazon, Netflix, Hulu, YouTube, it's a very big discussion point for us. Um, we are linking to uh, digital sales of our content. We're linking to um, sales of our hard goods that are you know, on Amazon or other places that they're aggregated. And we do a pretty good business with the cafe presses of the world where we have classic brands that don't have a lot of consumer products where you can just click and customize your own content, your own products and, and have it shipped that day and we get a 20% commission. So I think it's I think it's a big part of the future that is, you know, right around the corner that everybody's working on and important to us. I think we have time for one more question and then a wrap up. I work with a business called Flutter. They do uh, video streaming interactive. Robotics, uh, animation, and they have a lot of stuff. How interested are you guys in doing robotics to the internet? Is that the audience able to control uh, robotics and interact? Depends on the experience, I would say, right? You know, <laughs> I, I, I agree. I mean, I think it depends on experience. Like, you know, like 65 years ago, I did a show called Teddy Ruxpin. And Teddy Ruxpin was a, a talking doll that we encoded uh, in the video uh, in the vertical blanking. And you could watch these cartoon shows and the doll would sit there and talk to you. Um, I think that that's a very big opportunity moving forward. Um, but I agree that it depends on the experience and what the product is. Um, and unfortunately, I haven't really seen anything in the last couple of years that really has dazzled us. Yeah, I'd say the same. Yeah, I mean, anything that would give another layer of getting to be a part of the show, whether it's voting on Twitter or using a robot hand to spin the wheel, I mean, it's all it's all possible. And again, it depends on the experience, but the more we can get people to be involved, the better. As we wrap up, I just want to go down the panel. Uh, this is uh, Ira's uh, tribute question. Uh, so, <laughs> you know, where where will we be uh, a year from now? What do you see just over the horizon? We gather again next fall. Where will we be? Where will we be? In Marina Del Rey. I, I always like. <laughs> I always like to say that you know when we're. The people that are in the industry, we don't really notice things um, uh, until you actually make a conscious effort to s stand back and take a look. You know, I, I pointed out earlier that it wasn't very long ago, five, six years ago, where the, the digital ownership experience was dramatically different. Like there was no cloud, there were no redownloads, there was no streaming. Like it was really pretty different. And, uh, you know, I think from year to year, it's really hard to see where the differences are. Um, unless you have that discipline to really take a step back. I mean, there are a lot of trends. I, I think, you know, we've heard some of them earlier, more bandwidth, more experimentation, more um, new new business models. Um, you know, I think all of that's going to happen. It's going to feel very incremental between now and next year. I would say uh, consumers having more a la, a la carte choice offerings. Plain and simple. 
I'll agree, um, but more specifically, I think more OTTs, you know, CBS and HBO just announced. I think that there's going to be just a whole handful of them, whether they're independents or they're ad-supported or they're subscription. I think that Netflix will start offering specific s subscriptions. Um, so I think that that you know subscriptions that are you know under ten bucks or under five bucks will be very big business a year from now. Before it passes on, I, I'll probably um, mention we're going to start hearing a lot more about four K too. <laughs> I just got the prices right set to look right in HD. Uh, <laughs> take your time. Um, no, for us, I think uh, we're going to keep. Pushing the envelope creatively, uh, trying to trying to get our our audience to continue to consume what we're putting out. Um, but the, again, the year is such a short amount of time because we've basically developed everything we're going to do. I can tell you what we're going to do for the next eight months. So we've already long lead in, in the studio business. It's way further out than that. So I mean, I think we're going to keep uh, attacking the same things we're doing, which is second screen, uh, social media, other web series and that kind of thing to, to keep pushing the, pushing our brand and getting it out there, but slow on 4K. Yeah. How about uh, model searches? I want to build, I want to build, um, <laughs> yeah, great. I want to build on Mike's point because for us, it's really going to be, I, I think, the continued evolution of the creative directors and producers that are thinking about programming and the CTOs and the technologists actually getting together at the beginning of the process rather than what happens today, which is you know 15 steps down the road when the show is about to go on air in two months. And, and that is a, a pretty large sea change in the way that we conceptualize the programming that we all watch on television or films or, or, or whatever other mediums you play in. That, that in a year will continue to change for us because we're already starting to see the tip of that where you know, 15, 18, 24 months ago, people weren't having those conversations about what's possible they were mostly thinking about what the creative of the show is. Today, we actually are in conversations where what you would think of as a chief technical officer, whose job it is to figure out the technical stack of things, sits at the table as you're thinking about the hooks in a show and the engine that drives the characters and the way in which the programs actually will play out on television uh, in particular, but it's bleeding into all the other mediums. So I think you know that's the exciting part for us, but that's certainly the thing that in one year's time is potentially real. I mean, I, I, you're going to see a lot more theaters playing alternative content. You're going to hear a lot more about events. And I think that things that you typically wouldn't see in a movie theater that you've seen on these other platforms, you you will see in a movie theater this in 2015. So, yeah. Cool. You know, as we wrap up, we have time actually to ask the audience a question. Uh, so if anybody, uh, we can get answers from several, several people. Uh, so just speak up. You can all shout at once. Uh, but what were, uh, what is the sort of single most interesting thing that each of you has seen or experienced as a consumer of entertainment this year? Awesome. Yeah. Yeah. Anybody else? Anything else? Everybody been too busy working? Well, All right. Customers out there. Anybody? <laughs> anybody missing anything? Anybody? You have you have two minutes to ask ask the ask the panelists to deliver something that you wish you had. <clears throat> you see everybody's so happy yeah mm -hmm. a satisfied audience yeah. satisfied. satiated well, if you they're will. ready for lunch they're ready for lunch <laughs> gentlemen i really want to thank each and every one of you thank you thank you, thank you. and thank you